Hello. Welcome back to another episode of A Dose of Sass. It's Caitlin of Sass and Cellulite. And today I'm talking about something kind of fun. And that is some like questions and assumptions about being an influencer. I'm going to answer a lot of nitty gritty questions that like sometimes people just don't answer straight up. And I also am going to say that these are all answers according to my personal experience. This is not going to be a how to become an influencer episode. I'm not interested in teaching you how to do that because it's truly an individual experience. And there's a lot of better people out there on the internet that have tips and tricks for that kind of thing. And my number one piece of advice is figuring out what you're passionate about and talking about it. But I am going to talk about like, how do I make money? How many things do I get for free? Like how many things do I keep? How often do I shop? What does it actually look like on the back end of TikTok creator fund? Like all of those things. So let's just jump right in. Also, I don't have my little mic today because I'm recording on Zoom and I now feel like I have two full hands to use. So sorry if I'm a little bit more expressive. If you're watching this on YouTube, <laughs> I'm going to be flailing a little bit more than usual, but it's fine. So let me back up just a smidge, give a little backstory. I am currently what I would consider an influencer full time, but that has not always been the case. So let me give a little history lesson. Uh, fun fact about me, I actually started school as a musical theater major. I grew up doing theater and I thought that was going to be the thing I wanted to do. I do love performing and singing and acting and all of that, but I very quickly realized that I wanted something with a steady paycheck. I felt strongly that if I wanted to do musical theater as a career, I could, and I didn't necessarily need a degree in it. And so I, after one semester, switched my major to marketing and I went on to get my degree in marketing, which I absolutely love. I find it ironic now that the whole reason I switched my major was to pick something that had a steady paycheck. And, and now you could say that I perform in a sense for a living and don't make a steady paycheck. So... <laughs> Things just come full circle. But I did get my degree in marketing and I worked in a corporate marketing job for over four years for an architecture firm. I did like, when people say, when you hear marketing, it can mean a lot of different things. I did a little bit more like graphic design side stuff, putting proposals together. It was much more like formal marketing as opposed to like social media marketing or website or brand. Like I wasn't doing the like Gen Z fun stuff. I was doing the like, corporate formal stuff. And I didn't love it. There were things I liked about it and things I didn't, but ultimately it was not something I was passionate about. So I spent several years in corporate marketing. And at the same time, in about 2020, I started doing my own social media. So for the last three years of my corporate job, I was doing social media stuff on the side. And I was doing a lot of different things, not just my social media, but social media management. And brand design here and there, graphic design. And I was doing custom portraits at one point. And I opened a Etsy sticker shop at one point. Like I've worn a lot of hats because I cannot sit still. <laughs> and I have this innate grip tonight, if you will, to go, 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 do, do, do more, more, more. And because I didn't love my corporate job, I was constantly chasing anything that could make me money outside of my corporate job so that I could one day quit. And that's not why I started doing my social media when I started creating content, I wasn't like, yeah, this will one day make me money and then I'll hit it big. Like I, I genuinely started it from a place of sharing my own personal journey and what I was going through. And then I started to, and then like, as that grew, I realized that there were ways I could make money, but it wasn't like how I started it. I feel like influencers have definitely, the influencer industry has definitely grown in the last several years that people now I do think can start from a place of, I want to I want influencer to be my job and I know I can do that. So let me start doing that. Whereas a lot of people kind of like stumbled into that position, <laughs> but I would be lying if I said, I didn't hope that it could one day replace my corporate income. And I did finally quit my corporate job in July of 2023. So it has been almost a year of having quit my job, which is crazy because I sometimes feel like it was just yesterday. And I still feel like I'm kind of getting my feet a little bit and trying to figure out like, it's weird because I'm like, oh, I want to figure out like what a routine looks like, what a day in the life looks like for me. But like kind of what I love about it is the fact that it's really flexible and there's not really a lot of structure and, and it's up to me and I get out what I put in and routine is like, I'm redefining what routine means, I guess, for myself in this new season. So the big question is, 
how did you make enough money to quit your job? Because that's that was the only thing stopping me from quitting my job beforehand. And I'm going to be 100% real and honest with you. I don't. I do not make enough money to complement my corporate job. I was making a good amount of money at my corporate job in San Francisco. And I have the incredible privilege of being financially assisted by my parents at the moment. That's not the goal long-term. I would love to get to the point where I make a consistent enough income to not need their assistance, but I'm going to be hundred percent real with you and say that that is the driving force of the ability to quit my job. Because the main thing about being an influencer or a contract creator or fill in the blank is that money is really, really inconsistent. Yes, you can make good money in it, in brand deals and commissions and all this kind of stuff. But every single month is going to look different. Every single week is going to look different. You're going to have highs and you're going to have lows. And when I first quit my job, I was like on an upward slope. Things were looking good. I was like, oh, I'm going to be chilling. In like six months, I'm not going to need my parents anymore. We're going to be fine. And then like the last few months, I'm like, oh. (laughs) So I just want to throw that out there that when you see someone online, and I haven't been, I haven't been totally open about this on the internet because I just like, It's not something I really talk about, but like, if you see someone online and wonder how the heck do they afford what they do, they might have help. My, my husband also has a full-time job and I have help from my parents. Like that's, that's the thing, but I do make money. So let me tell you about it. One of the main ways that people make money and the way that I make money is through brand collaborations. So brands will pay me to make a video and that's like a flat rate situation. My rate for an Instagram reel is between two and $3,000 which is awesome. Like It's crazy to think that I can make a 30 second video and someone's going to pay me $3,000 for it. And there's a lot that goes into like how that rate is calculated. And a lot of it is truthfully just made up. And that doesn't mean that every single sponsored video I do is going to be that. Every single one's going to look a little bit different because people can also pay, brands can also pay for usage So if they want to use my video and run it as an ad, that's something additional that I charge for. If they want to run it for 30 days, that's a 30 day rate. If they want to run it for 90 days, then they have like a per month added thing. Some brands can just, I don't ever have to post it and they'll just run it as an ad. I just made the video for them. Maybe they'll run it on their social media feed. That's a whole different price. You'll see, you'll hear people talking about UGC, user generated content. And some people only do user generated content. Like they don't even have a social media following. They're just good at creating video content. And so they'll get connected with brands and create content for them. I don't do a ton of that. I would like to, because it does pay pretty well, but that's another way that people make money. And that's the thing that's probably the most inconsistent income stream as an influencer is trying to get consistent brand collaborations. The dream, the goal for influencers everywhere is to have like a couple long-term partnerships that you are in like contract to do a video for them every month. And then you can guarantee that you're going to get 2K every month or whatever. That would be ideal. I have yet to have something long-term. I've done multiple videos for a company here and there, but nothing. Actually, I did a long time ago, a couple of years ago, I did a six-month contract with Cupshe, the swimwear brand, but they did not pay me very well. And their stuff is really cheap. It's not super size inclusive. I like looking back on that, I wish I hadn't, but I was really trying to make some money. <laughs> so you take what you can get sometimes, but that's one of the main income streams brand collaborations. And right now I haven't had a brand deal in like two months. It is, my email inbox is dry. I don't know what's going on. I don't know why suddenly I'm just like not getting a lot of inbound brand requests, but things are slow there at the moment. I get a lot of Amazon seller crap. I get a lot of random spammy Amazon brands offering me to, offering me like $20 to promote their t-shirt not going to do that. So that's one of the main ways that people make money. That's the way I make money. Another big one is Amazon affiliate. So let me answer some questions about Amazon. There are people like Amazon dedicated people, Amazon fashion people, Amazon home find people, Amazon organized people that make thousands of dollars a month on Amazon commission. And what it is, is you don't get commissions. I had somebody ask you like, how do commissions work? I don't get a commission anytime someone clicks on my link. Like I don't get paid per click. I only get paid if somebody purchases the item. So if you click on one of my links and you purchase it, there are little cookies that track that information and I will get 
a commission from your purchase. Sometimes I'll get a commission from every everything in your purchase, not the single, not just the single item that you clicked on, which is cool. But commission rates, how much I get paid per sale varies wildly. Every single brand and item on Amazon has a different commission rate. For example, I sold like 20 walking pads one month and they're like 200 bucks each. You would think like, oh, heck yeah. She must have made bank doing that. I made like $25. And yet I, I sold like 30 sweaters and I made like $60 because the commission rate was higher on the sweaters than it was on the walking pads. And I have no control over every single brand's commission decision. It is the wild, wild west on Amazon. But I only get I only get paid commission if somebody actually purchases the thing through my link or through my storefront. And I'd say that's one of the more consistent streams of income I can rely on. I don't go like way overboard on the Amazon stuff. I don't, I'm not trying to be an Amazon influencer, quote unquote. But I do, as a regular person, shop at Amazon frequently. And so therefore, I share what I buy. And my regular sharing, I'd like to say that my regular sharing, where I feel like this isn't, I'm not going above and beyond creating Amazon content. I can still rely on probably like $500 a month in commissions, averagely, which is cool. Like, I'm, <laughs> that's fantastic. It's great. $500 would make a big difference in a lot of people's lives. But I'm not out here making thousands and thousands and thousands like some of these other creators are. The other thing is there's a little bit of confusion. I don't know if this is intentional or not, but there's the Amazon Influencer Program, which I thought kind of just can, which I thought just kind of includes everyone who creates like an Amazon storefront and, you know, puts their stuff there is considered an Amazon influencer, but there are different kind of incentives for different groups of Amazon influencers. And I don't know everything about that. Some people I've heard get paid per like post that they put on Amazon. You can upload like photo and video content and tag your little products in it, similarly to how you can do it on like to know it. You can do that on Amazon. And some people get paid like just for doing that. I don't, I don't know how you do that. I would love to. <laughs> You also, on the back end, they have this thing called like creator connections where I can sign up to promote specific items and get a higher commission rate on those things. And then I believe if I make a certain amount of sales, I can get a bonus on those items. I haven't done any of those because it's it requires you to mark that. If you, if you make a video about that specific product, you're required to mark it as an ad, but they're not paying me directly to make the video the way a brand and a formal brand collaboration would. So I'm like, I don't want to say this is an ad because it's like not, but like I am getting commission for the thing, but I do get commission for pretty much everything. So it's not really that different. It, it's kind of weird. And I wish I could just like share the link and get extra commission, but I'd have to disclose it was an ad. And because it's a different kind of ad than you would see me doing a formal like brand collaboration like Bowflex, then I don't want those two things to be conflated. It's just a little bit messy. Create like Amazon influencer program just feels a little bit messy. So I just stick with what I know. I share my products in my storefront. I share links to things and I get the commission I get. You can even go like live on Amazon and make like shoppable videos. And I think people get paid to do that. I, I'm not doing that. I don't know how to do that. I don't want to do that. And when I, and, and another thing is when I make sales on Amazon, not only do I get commission, but if I hit a certain amount of sales, then they send me a hundred dollar gift card every month, which is not very much considering the amount of money that I'm making them. So they want you to hit $2,000 in sales, not $2,000 in commission. $2,000 in sales for them is like $100 in commission for me. So I'm like, $2,000 in sales should be like $200 for me <laughs> as a gift card, like at the minimum. Like that just feels like really incredibly unfair. There was one month where I made like $24,000 for Amazon in their sales. And yet they're like, here's a $100 gift card. Boo. I mean, it's better than nothing, but I feel like that's super... I feel like the amount should increase based on the amount of sales you make for Amazon. 
because they're getting the money back anyway. They're giving me a hundred dollars store credit. They're not giving me a hundred dollars. So they're gonna get the hundred dollars back anyway. Stupid, but I do get that. So that's another thing, brand collapse, Amazon commissions. Now let's talk about like to know it, which is similar, but different. Like to know it is a separate app where I can link like all of my outfits, home decor, kitchen stuff. People can link like food stuff on there. I don't really know who, who all is like shopping food products online. Not me, but that's like anything that's not on Amazon and even things that are on Amazon, you can link on like to know it. Not every single brand is on like to know it, which can be annoying sometimes. The main big retailers are going to be on there. And again, and those commission rates also vary per brand. And the payout, here's where it's really, really annoying. Amazon, uh, this is what I didn't say. Amazon commissions get paid out on a net 60 basis. So the sales I make in January, I'll get paid for in March. And that's the other thing about influencer income. It's like, yeah, you can kind of plan on stuff, but a lot of times, and same with brand deals, a lot of times brand deals are paid on a net 30, net 45, net 60 basis. So if I did something back in January, I might not get paid for it until March. And so you kind of have to like plan and budget a little bit differently. So that was kind of funky at first when I quit my job in July is I was like, okay, here's everything I made in August. Like, yay, first month out of job, except for like everything I got paid for in August is actually things that I did in June. So I couldn't really gauge how well I was doing post corporate job. <laughs> so anyway, Amazon is net 60, 60 days till a payout. Like to know it, every single brand has a different payout schedule. And I still haven't figured out how long it is. The main things that I sell through Like to Know It are like Old Navy and Target. And I want to say, like, I think they are upwards of like 90 days, like maybe 120 days until I get paid for that. So that's really annoying and difficult because I can't really rely on like, oh, okay, this is how much I'm going to make monthly on Like to Know It because the payouts are every two weeks, but I never know how much I'm getting in those two weeks because every single payout schedule is different. So I'm gonna be 100% honest with you. I've used like to know it since probably 2021 and, and I have made $5,915 total in the last like three years. So that's cool, but that means like month to month, this month to date, I've made $253, which is awesome. But it's not, I am not one of those people. And I am someone who has like a decently large audience. I have over 300,000 followers across platforms. And yet I'm still making a couple hundred bucks. <laughs> and I'll see it in a few months. Some months I get like $45 because that's what's actually finally paid out from the brand that I, you know, from whatever I sold. And some months I get like $400 that I finally made, you know, three months ago. It's just... So I can't really rely on that as a steady income stream. It's almost, it's like a nice bonus when I finally get a like to know it payment. I'm like, oh, cool. I have no idea what that's from, but that's nice to know. And again, I don't get paid like per click. I only get paid if you actually purchase something. And I do get commission subtracted if you return the thing. That's why the commission pay, payouts take so long. I think they're waiting for whatever brand's return window to close. So you can't, I can't just have somebody buy hundred dollars worth of stuff, give me commission and then return a hundred dollars stuff worth of stuff. And I get to keep the commission. No, I like it goes back. They don't ever take money away from me, but that's why it takes so long to pay out because they're waiting for those return windows to close, which is super annoying, but I get it. So those are like my main three influencer income streams. There are other things that I do outside of social media that make me money. I do Pinterest management. I do some freelance marketing that's related to my cor previous corporate job. I do like odd one-off job things here and there. <laughs> and I like, I like keeping that variety. I like doing those things. I would love if I made a steady enough influencer income or a city enough freelance income so that everything could just be a nice bonus. The main reason I wanted to finally take the leap from quitting my corporate job to doing this full time is because I knew that I was just hitting this wall of like, I don't have enough hours in it 
in a day. I'm never going to have enough hours in a day to make enough social media money to quit my corporate job, but I can't quit my corporate job because I don't make enough social media money. Like it was this back and forth of like, I can't not do both. And if I'm going to make the leap, I'm going to need help. But once I finally have the time and the full-time schedule to dedicate to social media content, I know that I can make a, enough income to replace my corporate income, but I can't do that while still having my corporate job. So that's the main thing that made me make the leap. And the consistency is the hardest part, but I have seen a lot of growth in having my full time dedicated to it. Since quitting my corporate job, I've gained over 100,000 followers on Instagram. That's crazy. That's crazy. I still can't even fathom that I have that amount of people following me on the internet. I'm like, what? What are you doing here? And so with the growth of my social media platforms, yes, I can charge more from brands. I, I'm probably making more affiliate income and commission and having a more flexible schedule allows me to create more content and spend my time talking to brands, doing freelance work, building my social media portfolio, if it will. So having this be my full-time job is paying off, but I don't want you to think that I'm just like out here swimming in money because I'm not. I'm also just a team of one. That's another like common question is like, do you have an assistant? Do you have somebody who manages these other things for you? No, I 100% do it all by myself. Actually, I have assisted other people in, in the last few months, which I do think is kind of fun. I'll help them with their like to know it or edit content or even like schedule posts for them. Other influencer friends of mine, like virtual influencer assistant. I do. I do enjoy doing that kind of stuff. But for me, I do everything myself from creating and posting and editing and posting on all the platforms, editing the podcast, managing my emails, all of it. So that's kind of, hopefully that kind of answers all your questions about like how I make money. Oh, oh, that's the other thing. Is people always wonder like, do you get paid just for like views on social media? Do you get paid per YouTube view, per Instagram view, per TikTok view? Let me break it down. Instagram used to have these reels bonuses, which was really nice. I think this was like a couple years ago now where if you hit a certain threshold of views, your video would like count towards this bonus. And like the amount of views you got was the amount that you got paid out. And I never got more than like $2,000, sorry, $200 in a month. And that was for like a million views across a lot of videos, like a million views total for the month plus. And they were giving me like 200 bucks. I was like, cool, great, this is nice. But on their little thing, it was like, if you get, you know, 5 million views, you could earn up to like $5,000. And yet they were only paying everybody like $200. <laughs> and they don't have that program anymore. I have no reels bonuses. Maybe some people still do. I don't. I don't get paid for just Instagram video views. I wish I did. I don't get paid for YouTube views, although I believe that I might be able to soon. I grew on, on YouTube recently. I had a video kind of pop off there. And now I have almost 5,000 subscribers, which is awesome. And I think that might be a certain threshold to where I can monetize things. But I it is dependent on the amount of views you've gotten in the last like 30 days. So it's you won't get paid for like, oh, I had one video hit a million views and that's the only video I've ever posted. You do have to like be a consistent creator there. And I believe you can get paid per view, but I haven't totally looked into all of that yet. The main one that people talk about is the TikTok creator fund is they say that like TikTok creators just get paid for posting videos. And for some people that's true, but there are certain qualifiers. You have to have more than 5,000 followers and the video has to be more than a minute long. Most of my content like is not that long. Most of my content is under a minute. I'm still doing a lot of short form video and then they just don't qualify for payment whatsoever. But for the few videos that I have had that are over a minute long, let me just tell you what I've made doing that. In the last year on TikTok, for all of my videos over a minute long, I've made $23. In a year, in the last week, I've made 21 cents. So I don't really understand if what I'm doing is like wrong or different or how people are making thousands of dollars a month in the TikTok creator program because I'm not. So if it's your assumption that people are getting paid for every single video they post on the internet, it's not true. I'm not getting paid for most of the things that I do on the internet. And that's why interacting with people's sponsored content 
is so helpful and so important is because once a brand finally pays me to make something and I've made that one dedicated video for them, it needs to perform well as the rest of my content and like everything else you get for free. I'm not getting paid to put out most of like 90% of the things that I put out for you. 95% of the things that I create for the internet, I do for free. So the 5% of the time that I'm doing something that I'm getting paid to do, please show it some love <laughs> because they're paying me based on the fact that I have this audience that loves everything else that I do. And there's always going to be a little bit of like both Instagram and TikTok and platforms in general tend to suppress sponsored content in general, which is annoying. So it's art, like brands are expecting it to do less to perform worse than your typical content, but it needs to perform similar. Otherwise it's going to look like you have a fake audience and some people do. <laughs> there are also a lot of people making money you doing TikTok shop. And I just, I don't even want to get into that. I don't know how much of it is true. I hate TikTok shop. Like, I think it's ruined TikTok as, a, as an experience. Every other video is somebody promoting some random ass product and saying, this is the absolute must need thing. Like, no, it's not. There's already enough Amazon must have viral this stuff without it being immediately shoppable within the app you're already in. Like, and so much of it is like really scammy brands. I don't know how much of it is legit. And creators are making commission for posting videos and then tagging the products below. And often they're getting sent that free item to make a video. Which here's the other thing. Ugh, TikTok shop seems so, feels so scammy to me in so many ways. Not only does the interface just feel really like illegitimate, but you could have like seven of the same product coming from like seven different brands that all have like a jumbled letter name. And they're probably just from some random warehouse on the other side of the world. <laughs> what is that? There are some like actual brands that I know I could shop outside of the internet that sell their items through TikTok shop, but like majority of them are just weird random products. I don't know how reputable they are. I don't know if I'm actually going to get what I want. I'm not purchasing anything through TikTok shop. And as a creator, you can sign up for, I get, I probably get like, 25 messages a day from random TikTok shop brands saying, hey, we'd love you to promote our product. We'll send it to you for free if you make a video about it. And I'm like, I don't know who you are. I don't want your random water bottle. And if I'm going to make a video for you, you should pay me. Because if I make a video about something that I'm making money off of, then I have to disclose it legally as an ad. But if they're not paying me to do it, then I don't want to disclose that as an ad. But under FTC guidelines, as an influencer, if you are getting paid for anything you do, even if it's just commission, you need to visibly and like writtenly <laughs> disclose that it's an ad. So many people don't do this, but you're legally required to. And so many videos on TikTok that are promoting items in TikTok shop are not marked like that. So you think, oh, this is just a random creator. This is just a random person on the internet talking about this sweatshirt that they just got in love. Oh, and look, it's linked right here. No, they're getting paid to do that. And if they're not saying that, then they're lying. And that's what's bothering me so much about TikTok shop is just so much of it is like unregulated sponsored content. And apparently people are making like thousands a month in TikTok shop and TikTok shop commission stuff, but it's just like, ugh, it feels so scammy. I don't want to be a TikTok shop influencer. I don't want every single video I post to have a little thing at the bottom that says like shop everything in the video. It makes me feel weird because the whole reason I started creating content on the internet in the first place was to share messages that I needed to see. And if the whole internet just divulges into everyone promoting the next best thing you need from Amazon, yeah, maybe we'll all make a bunch of money, but what are we even talking about? And that's like the kind of weird line I find myself walking is like, yes, I probably could create, I probably could make more Amazon commission. I probably could make more like to know it commission. But in order to do that, I would need to like double the frequency that I am talking about sellable stuff and I don't want that to be what my platform is about. I don't want you to think of me as your number one resource of things to buy. No, I want to be your number one resource for confidence, for normalizing your body, for giving you permission to exist. 
And yes, every once in a while, I'll say, by the way, if you have, if you're looking for a water bottle, here's my favorite one. And yay, I'll make a little bit of money off of that. But I don't want, like, just if everything I share is just buy this, buy this, buy this, it just feels so shallow and meaningless. But sometimes I consider it, I consider upping the frequency of my Amazon posts because your girl needs money. Your girl's trying not to be dependent on her parents. But if I do too much Amazon content in a row, I start to get real burnt out on it. <sighs> it's a weird one. Another question I get is how many things do I get for free? How much do I actually get for free or PR? What is PR? So PR packages, public relations you know, packages, are when a brand sends me something that I didn't ask for and I'm not getting paid for or and I'm not getting asked to post about it. So if they're just saying, hey, we want to send you a product because we think you'll like it, and maybe you'll post about it, but I'm not legally obligated to in any sort of way, and I'm not getting paid for posting it. If you see something with like hashtag PR on my Instagram story, then that, that I just received it for free and I'm sharing it for fun. If it says hashtag ad or hashtag commissionable link, you'll see me do this on all of my links on my Instagram stories. If I'm gonna make any kind of commission on it, even if it's a cent, I have to legally disclose that it is a commissionable link. I don't see anybody else doing it. Like 98% of influencers are not doing it, but it is illegal. So if you see ad or commissionable link, then I will maybe make some money on it, but it's probably not gonna be very much. If you just see PR, I'm making zero dollars. So now I wanna get into something related, but also a little bit more nuanced. And that is like, how often do I shop? How many things do I keep in return? Why don't I shop more small brands and all of that? So let's dive into it. So like I've already detailed, I'm not making Bonko bucks a month. Therefore, I do not have Bonko bucks a month to spend on shopping sprees. I am not trying to do $500 Abercrombie hauls every single week. Now, if I was, and here's the thing that, here's the thing is if I was doing that, then I probably would make Bonko bucks in like to know it commissions, but I can't afford to do that in the first place. Therefore, I'm not making Bonko bucks in like to know it commissions. You kind of have to be able to afford to do that in order to make the money doing that. So when you see me doing a haul, you can bet that 90% of those things are getting returned which is why I love to do an in-store dressing room try on is because then I don't actually have to purchase any of the things <laughs> and I still get to show them to you and make a commission if you buy them. But I'm not out the money in the first place. <laughs> but as a plus size gal, my in-store shopping options are very limited. So I do have to do some online hauls. And the reason that majority of my clothing hauls that you see on my social media are from places like Amazon and Target and Old Navy are because that's where I actually shop as a person. I'm not going to pretend to you that I'm shopping at places like Madewell and Anthropology and Abercrombie for the sake of social media content and for the sake of like to know a commission when I'm not ever actually shopping there as a person. I would never keep any of those things because those are out of my budget. I'm not going to spend $70 minimum on a pair of pants. I'm going to spend $35. So I'm going to shop where in a place that's affordable for me. And that gets tricky when it comes to size inclusivity too. I am aware that Amazon is not a very size inclusive place. I have firsthand experience. That's why I do a series called Does It XL? Because as a 16, 18, I wear a size XL and everything from Old Navy. I wear XL and a lot of things from Target as well as XXL and 1X and some brands 2X. And I actually just bought a 3X thing. Sizing is wild. And so many things on Amazon stop at size XL, which is super, super, super annoying. And even when I put in like plus size summer dresses, they're still going to give me dress options that stop at size XL. And so I get to take the gamble of does XL actually fit me? Because some brand size charts, XL is a 16, 18. Some brand size charts, XL is 12, 14 or 14, 16. Some plus size brands don't start until 16. And so I don't want to get into the whole like mid-size plus size debate, but I do feel like 16, 18 is a really awkward size place to be when it comes to shopping because I'm taking a gamble on will I fit the largest size at this brand. And if I can, and I love it, and I can afford it, and I want to keep the thing, then I feel awkward because 
as a regular person, I'm like, yeah, great. I found a dress I love. But as an influencer with a platform and, a, and as a person who's passionate about size inclusivity, if I share on my Instagram story, the dress I'm wearing today, and it stops at a size XL, I'm going to feel really bad about that because no, it's not inclusive. And I wish it came in other sizes, but also like, I'm just a person buying things that fit in my like. And so it, it's really hard because I'm like, Am I supposed to only buy from brands that have larger sizes than me? If I like something from a brand and it happens to fit me, but it doesn't have more sizes, am I not allowed to have it? Like, is that my responsibility as an influencer? Or like, can I also just be a regular consumer? And like, if there was anybody else in a smaller body, like if somebody was a size medium and they had no issues shopping, nobody would fault them for sharing stores that they fit in. But as a mid-size plus size gal, if I don't share, if I share items from a brand that doesn't fit other mid-size plus size gals, then that's not very inclusive of me. And I'm going to get flack about it, understandably so. But I also can't afford to shop at all the size inclusive places. So do I, as an influencer, shop these brands that I don't normally shop just for the sake of showing my audience, hey, here's some more inclusive options and doing the work for them. Even though I'm never actually realistically shopping there and everything that I tried on for you, I'm getting returned. And if I'm actually going to buy some pants, they're going to be from a, a brand that I can afford and unfortunately is less size inclusive. Or do I continue to shop as a regular person and hope that, that maybe the thing comes in larger sizes? And if so, yay, great, I'll share it. But also I no longer, like as a full-time influencer, I no longer can just like buy something. There's this like, as an influencer now, my purchasing decisions always come with a second thought of like, how is this going to be perceived by my audience? Is this something my audience can buy? Because is this something I'm able to make commission on? That's a plus. Is this something that is size inclusive? That's a plus. If it's not, then I might not want to share it. But if I don't, then I'm not going to make any money. It, it's really awkward. <laughs> These are tough questions. The nicest brands like Athleta and Universal Standard and Good American that carry larger sizes are also really expensive. And that's the other thing is I don't want to like, if I'm not actually shopping there as a real life person, then I'm not going to pretend to you that I am because I want to share things that I know and love. And I don't want to like, it just feels kind of fake for me to be like, here's some gorgeous plus size finds from anthropology, even though I'm not going to keep those. I'd love to, I'm sure they're gorgeous, but day to day, the things that you see get me getting dressed from my closet are going to be from Target, Old Navy, and Amazon. <laughs> nine, nine times out of ten. And then I ask myself questions sometimes of like, should I keep this one nice thing from Anthropology or this one nice thing from Madewell? So that when people ask what my favorite such and such is, I have something more inclusive to share with them. And that's weird too, because then I'm sharing something that I have but don't necessarily actually use. And I'm keeping it for like inclusivity points. Uh, it's weird. It's weird. I don't know what to do. This is, the, this is the thought process that I go through. And then people ask, why don't you shop at more like smaller brands? And the main, main reason I don't do that is because most of the time they don't have a return policy. And so one, if the sizing is weird, I'm just out the money. If I had to order two sizes and something that I just get store credit for my return and hope that I find something else that I like. And if I'm only getting store credit for a return for my purchases, yeah, I could still send them back, but I'm still out the money. So then that requires me to be able to afford to do shopping sprees. Shopping from smaller plus size brands is going to be probably $200 for four items. And I can't afford to do that every single week. And I don't want to pretend to you like I can. I would love, I would love to shop more boutiques and small businesses. But until I make enough money on commission for the other things that I currently buy, I won't be able to afford to do so. And if I can't afford to do so, then I'm not going to guess that most of my audience can either. And most of these places don't have storefronts, so I can't go to the store and try them on. This is the dilemma. This is what's difficult, difficult with a big asterisk, because I know there are bigger problems in the world. But this is what's difficult about being an influencer, is this weird line of like, you have to spend money to make money. You have to be able to afford 
to shop in order to make commission on the things that you shop. Amazon return policy is great. That's why I took a gamble there is because I know I can return it. So until size inclusive brands are more affordable or more affordable brands are more size inclusive, then I'm just stuck here. So that's my life. Do I keep most of the things I buy? No. <laughs> so that's it. That's the reality of what I do for a job. Every single day looks different. I still do a lot of things outside of my own social media, but it's a really inconsistent job. And while I definitely make money, it might not be as much as you think it is. Or maybe it's more. I don't know. Every single person is going to be different. But I hope that was like a little bit insightful or at least interesting about like some of the behind the scenes of being an influencer and what that looks like as a job. If you have more questions, I'll put up a box on my Instagram story. Happy to chat about it. Maybe I'll do a part two to this episode. I hope you enjoy this episode. I'll talk to you soon.